So we'll we'll go now to our final panel. Um, this will be a keynote session, um, and we want to welcome Assistant Secretary Fannin. And you can um, just make a transition here. You want to turn your camera on. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I am very pleased to welcome uh, Francis Fannin. He's the Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Energy Resources at the US State Department. Um, previously, Assistant Secretary Fannin has served in senior positions in BHP and Murphy Oil, as well as counsel to the United States Senate. Um, so he has very broad experience in energy from different perspectives that he brought to this position. Um, and uh, we have a couple of different issues that we want to discuss today. Um, so welcome, Assistant Secretary Fannin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be with you. I uh, followed your work, and thanks for the your and the dialogue's contribution to uh, issues of, of of importance to all of us. Thank you. Well, let's go right into the questions. Um, so I mentioned in my opening remarks when we started the conference off this morning uh, that you recently visited several countries in South America: uh, Suriname, Guyana, Brazil, Colombia. I'm not sure if it was in that order, but those, those four, uh, you accompanied uh, Secretary of State Pompeo. So I think it would be really interesting if you could tell us about, you know, what were the objectives of the trip, what was accomplished, if you could sort of tell us about that, um, that would be very interesting. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for having me. Uh, so the, the purpose of the, uh, of the trip was really to, to, to strengthen the bilateral relationship and, and a core component of that is in the context of energy diplomacy and, and our economic diplomacy. Uh, you know, of course, it's, it's no secret, the geography where these countries are, they're all around Venezuela. So there was a considerable component on, on, on that and, and addressing and, and supporting of the diaspora uh, that the illicit, illegitimate or Maduro regime has really created uh, effectively a humanitarian crisis. And so that was part and parcel to all of the, the discussions uh, we had in all of the countries. Um, you know, this was also a history making trip uh, for the United States. This is the first time uh, a secretary of state, a sitting secretary of state has, has visited uh, both Suriname and Guyana, either country. It was the first time amazingly um, that, 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 that we did do that. In Suriname, uh, the delegation uh, we've met with uh, with uh, President Santoki and his cabinet uh, of, on a variety of issues. Um, and, and one of the areas that they're they're seeing their neighbor Guyana with this amazing oil discovery. Uh, and so they were uh, and they've recently had an Apache like consortium with Total uh, recently announced a pretty significant discovery there as well. And so some of the our work uh, there were were to help. Uh, strengthen the resolve of Suriname, make sure that they continue to continue on on the democratic kind of path. Um, and, and, and given that they're new to this uh, resource development, uh, the secretary really underscored uh, that the private sector led, transparent private sector led economic growth model is the best model around the world. Uh, and, and that when you partner with uh, US particular, US or Western, let's just say, but US in particular, uh, private company, uh, you're really partnering with with an, with, a, with with an entity that's there that's going to abide by the highest standards uh, of, of transparency, uh, of environmental quality and accountability, uh, and they ask for a, a level playing field, uh, and and that there's not going to be this notion of, of state level involvement because it's a true private sector uh, investment. So we were it was a really positive uh, discussion there. Um, of course, we discussed, uh, then we moved to Guyana, uh, where the, the president uh, in Guyana significantly uh, really recognized Secretary Pompeo uh, support for a peaceful transition to, to democracy. As you and some of your viewers may be aware, Guyana was in this interperiod of uncertainty in terms of waiting for the elections to be ratified. Uh, and Secretary Pompeo uh, was, was, was a pretty considerable force and calling for uh, transparency and fairness in that election outcome. Uh, we were very pleased to see uh, that eventually the, the people of Guyana had their, had, had their 
and we were in the United States also, certified the election uh, as appropriate. Um, we, we see this amazing, um, uh, this amazing wealth that's being generated potentially, uh, given the huge discoveries there. Right now they're producing with this Exxon Hess led consortium about 100,000 barrels right now, but they're gonna ramp that up in a very short period of time to 750,000. Uh, and, and then a, a potential recovery uh, of uh, some 8 billion barrels. Um, this could be uh, really transformative uh, for the country. And this is a country of about 750,000 people. So the scale of this economic windfall, if managed properly, uh, it could be really transformative in a positive way. Uh, we spoke to a variety of, 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 of views in, in Guyana and really, um, they, they really wanna uh, bring back jobs, bring back the diaspora to help put forth a development path for their country. And we see such, such considerable promise uh, there. We, uh, you know, the, the secretary really underscored that, uh, that he wants to ensure that the opportunities of this, this wealth is also uh, wealth that belongs to all of the Guyanese people and the, and the consistent refrain of, for operations in a transparent and fair way that re reflect the democratic values that the recent election and the outcome really was there to support. You know, Guyana is at this, at this opportunity, it is fork in the road. And, and so we are confident that they'll continue on the, on the, on the right path. Uh, we also announced um, some support. We've, in terms of the bureau that I lead, uh, has been involved in Guyana for some time. Um, but in this context, we announced some support to help them ensure uh, environmental quality management uh, in terms of their offshore production, in terms of spill response. So we're, we're helping in, in that regard uh, very materially. Um, also, we did talk about Venezuela in that context and Guyana's support through, uh, through the OAS and, and for the Lima Group for calling for democracy next door. Um, we moved on to Brazil. In Brazil, uh, the secretary uh, visited uh, a Venezuelan refugee camp where where we, uh, he had the opportunity to speak with a variety of voices there uh, from, and, and speak to some of the people. Uh, and, and it was quite a, I was there, it was quite a moving experience. Um, and it really demonstrated uh, that, that we're on the, set, the right side of history here uh, and seeing seen just what these people and talking to some of these people, what they've gone through and how Maduro has just destroyed their country, the country that they went back. And then there's a scene in, in all of the other countries, this demo, demo, democratic transition, they're calling for it in their own country. Um, of course, we have ongoing programs in, in, in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of Brazil as well. Uh, in Colombia, uh, the secretary met with uh, the president, President Duque, and, and members of the cabinet. Uh, of course, Venezuela continued to be a part. You know, uh, the administration, uh, the Duque administration, really is a strong voice of of democracy. Uh, and call for fairness, transparency, uh, the, the exact kind of signals that we seek to encourage that will really uh, catalyze uh, private sector investment there. One of the areas that, um, that they're keen to do, and I know uh, Diego, the, the, the minister was, was, was on earlier, uh, and he spoke to this. And one of the programs that we launched, the Secretary, uh, Secretary Pompeo launched uh, there was, was in terms of helping them to develop their uh, the mineral sector governance in particular to develop their copper res resource uh, in a way that help, will help facilitate these calls for clean energy technology. Uh, and so it's, it's, it, was, it was a really remarkable trip. It was historic in so many ways uh, and really to be uh, with, real, with true partners in the region who share the same kind of uh, democratic values that we do uh, and, uh, and that they're calling for that their neighbor in Venezuela also uh, adopt. Right. So, the, yeah, these four countries are, are very important because, um, you know, as most people watching probably already know, Suriname and Guyana both held presidential elections this year. Both have recently discovered oil. In the case of Guyana, very clearly, you know, large volumes that are already in production. In the case of Suriname, still in earlier phases, but with a lot of potential. All and several different U.S. companies have assets there, so there's an important role for the U.S. And then Brazil and Colombia um, 
are two of the countries that have received the largest share of migration from Venezuela, um, particularly Colombia. Um, so um, I would like to ask you more about America Crece. It actually, I asked a question about it in our previous panel, and um, you know, it, it's, it comes up often in discussions about U.S. policy toward Latin America focused on energy. So I was wondering if you could give us some um, some more examples of the activities uh, the U.S. government is involved in with America Crece partners, be it you know the the countries that you recently visited or or other countries. Um, which which ones are most involved in this initiative? Yeah, thanks. So America Crece is a is a interagency whole of government effort, which uh, which which comprises a variety of levels of activity of, of economic. Uh, uh, partnership uh, to seeing that how economic and economic diplomacy can can really uh, bind countries together uh, more broadly. Um, well, the State Department, the, the ENR Bureau uh, leads the Amer the energy cone of uh, pillar of this whole of government efforts, and we have a variety of of, of other players who are involved. And I think that's important. Um, I mean, that's the, the State Department's role is to kind of be in terms of matters of foreign policy to provide that that whole of government level of engagement. But we have a variety of, 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 of uh, agencies who are participating and we can call on them to really take the lead on their respective uh, the technical capabilities and ensure that the countries who we're partnering with really gets uh, the totality of support from US government and however they uh, seek their own level of development and their own ambition and their own self-determined kind of course. Um, we, we really focused on uh, some of these uh, deals uh, and these MOUs we're having in, in, with countries is, is intended to promote and really catalyze private sector investment in energy and infrastructure across uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. You know, what, some of the work that we do in, in, in these MOUs, these government to government arrangements are really uh, to help facilitate the, the enabling environment, to identify obstacles uh, for why countries may or may not be seeing sufficient, in their view, uh, sufficient U.S. kind of investment, and identify what those are, see if we can remove those, those obstacles, and then bring, really bring in the private sector. They're the ones who are going to, to implement at scale the needs uh, of these countries. As of right now, we've signed uh, 11 MOUs with 11 countries in South America, Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, it continues to, 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 to grow and there's considerable interest and I'm pleased to hear that people are asking you about it. Um, that means we're getting the message out. Uh, but, but I think, you know, we're looking at the scale of investment that's required in the, in the, in the hemisphere. We've seen some numbers that Latin America and Caribbean will need 100 to $150 billion in annual infrastructure investment. Uh, in order to keep pace with uh, with the scale of the growth of their economies, but in particular ensuring a reliable energy access uh, and, and, and and going forward, um, we want to make sure that there's that these appropriate investment climates that I spoke about, based on the rule of law, transparency, uh, and sanctity of contracts, and really discourage kind of backsliding, which is which can be hard to do, uh, especially in this time of uh, of COVID nineteen. Um, where there's a bit of an emergency situation. Um, I think having the U.S. as a partner has, has helped countries uh, recognize that, there, that there's a place that they can turn for support. Uh, and so we provide that in a, in a variety of ways. And of course, Secretary Pompeo's recent trip is illustrative of that. Um, in particular, in, 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 you know, because these programs are, are, are based on the needs of, of each country, um, you know, it's for them to help to develop their own path. And so it, 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 it differs a little bit depending on the country. But just for example, in Central America, we're helping on uh, with electricity regulators to, who, who are keen to introduce renewable energy into, uh, in, into their national and regional power grids. Uh, we're looking to help them regulate LNG imports uh, so that they can look to gasify as an option because there's a lot of them seek to do. Um, and on Honduras and in, in, in Costa Rica, we've, we've worked on, uh, on distributed generation, uh, for example. In Argentina, we provided technical assistance uh, for oil spell response uh, and offshore tenders. They recently had one of their first offshore tenders in some dozen or, or decades. Uh, and we were pleased to see a U.S. company uh, win three blocks 
uh, in a fair and transparent 2019 bid round. Uh, in the Andean region, um, we're working with Peru uh, to improve grid operations and governance issues, uh, and also to help them develop their minerals governance framework uh, as well. Um, you know, these, these programs, again, are, are, are really bespoke to the needs of the country. The Carece MOU serves as that framework. Uh, a lot of times these, these governments prefer to have a government-to-government -government framework under which to, to, to then send the signal to the various ministries that may have an equity uh, to, to go ahead and, 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 and see what we can build out. Um, so there's the high-level MOU, and then these always, of course, uh, go down into relative um, uh, technical uh, work streams where we, again, uh, we bring in other, other uh, departments um, in, in that whole of government effort. Uh, also, I think it's important in that uh, we, we bring in uh, some of the development, uh, some of the, some, the money. <laughs> so uh, the, you know, the DFC, the Development International Development Finance Corporation is a part of, of this group. Uh, the U.S. Export Import Bank uh, uh, are also parts of this group. So we can really bring in how can we find, um, create the enabling environment, identify private sector opportunity, but also bring on um, U.S. financing support to help uh, uh, de-risk and catalyze some of that private sector investment and do it at scale. Um, I also think it's 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 worth noting. You know, I mentioned some work we're doing in Peru. Uh, we we're also pleased to see Peru is is, is really has a, a leadership role in their uh, historically in, in in managing their mineral wealth and their mineral resource, um, and and so we're partnering with them. In, in helping the rest of the world understand the lessons uh, that can be learned and in a broader uh, multi-country organization called the Energy Resource Governance Initiative. I was delighted to, to travel to, to Peru, to Lima, and also to Arequipa, uh, where I went and saw uh, some mining sites in country uh, and really saw the, the, the positive effect, how uh, mining can be done in a way that benefits the community. It can benefit uh, water quality. Uh, prior to this, uh, it happens to be a U.S. company, but going in there, uh, they help to rehabilitate an entire watershed. Now the communities downstream can fish again. They have potable water again, and they're doing it in partnership with the community uh, and, and developing this resource. So there's there's a lot that that, that can be drawn on there. Um, so th those are some other highlights. Yeah. For those who don't know what the Energy Governance Resource Initiative is and, and what it aims to achieve. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So, so uh, the Energy Resource Governance Initiative, um, you know, we came into this scene, the, the expansive growth and demand for clean energy technologies globally, all around the world, uh, it, it's significant. The World Bank has done some uh, reports on this, looking at uh, in, in the next 20 years, there'll be an increase in demand for some of these critical minerals of 500% plus. Um, and so we've, we, we said, well, if there's going to be this expansive growth, where are these minerals? Are they going to be developed in a way uh, that, that, that meets global best practice and, 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 and reflects uh, kind of the, the, the transparent democratic values, human rights, uh, environmental responsibility? And so what we've done is we're very proud of the U.S. model. Uh, we have a very successful long-term lessons learned, but long-term uh, best practice. We, we also realize we're not the only ones. So we partnered with um, Australia, Botswana, Peru, and Canada. Uh, total five countries spanning four continents with very diverse cultures, regulatory environments, and histories. Um, to come together and see, well, why have we been successful over the long term? Uh, are there lessons learned here uh, that we can distill down and then share with the rest of the world, given this expanse of new frontiers for, uh, for mineral development for clean energy technologies? Um, and so as a result of this work together, we launched an online toolkit, uh, ERGI.tools. It's free. Uh, it's, uh, anyone can go to it. And really, it, it, it's intended to provide uh, options for countries on how to establish uh, their own minerals governance framework, how to manage procurement, environmental stewardship, all these core questions. But it draws on these lessons learned. So that's the information component. 
Secondly, um, we're also backing that up with, uh, with providing capacity building uh, resourcing. Um, so basically translating that, helping countries translate the information uh, into implementation uh, for, to help to support their regulators. Um, this is not easy stuff. And, and so sometimes they can use some assistance. And then thirdly, uh, again, as I said earlier, governments only can do so much, but it's really the private sector that drives growth. Uh, and we wanna see more US companies, more Western companies investing globally. Uh, and so what we're seeking to do, what we have done, is we've integrated, working with the Development Finance Corporation, we've integrated these ERGI principles uh, into their lending so that a country that has, uh, uh, is working to implement ERGI um, and sign up to these principles on a project basis or however, will we'll, we'll receive a preference in terms of financing support from the DFC. Um, we're pretty excited about it. We've, we've really gotten a considerable amount of uptake. And I mentioned Colombia um, recently uh, signed up for some, some, some of the support in terms of their developing their copper belt. Um, I mean, the growth, I, I, th I think only recently is the world kind of coming to terms with the growth, uh, the ex exponential growth in this, in this area. I mean, just to put it in perspective, Back to copper, you know, copper is one of these cross-cutting minerals that provides for clean energy, but also for electric electric electrification more broadly. The World Bank did some numbers. They 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 said in the past five thousand years, humans have produced about five hundred and fifty million tons of copper. In the next twenty-five years, we'll have to produce that much again to meet electrification demand. I mean, so if you start thinking about the scale of what's happening. Um, we need to come up with uh, a new supply chain. Uh, we need to come up with greater degree of respect and integration of human rights, environmental quality, to ensure that um, this, these, the adoption of clean energy technologies is done to advance some of the shared values that we all, uh, most countries have in our hemisphere. Hmm. And for, for uh, my last question, I wanna go back to asking about Venezuela. Um, you talked about it earlier. And um, it, coming up very soon, later this year, uh, the country is supposed to hold national assembly elections, legislative elections. It's very complicated. It's unclear the, uh, whether you know, it's the um, uh, opposition to Maduro would even want to participate because of major concerns about fraud. Um, but I just wanted to ask you about what the State Department is doing um, especially in terms of, you know, promoting democracy in Venezuela. Yeah, well, we're working with our partners throughout the region. I mentioned the Lima Group, uh, the Organization of American States. Um, I think we've seen, in, and we're encouraging and continue to reach out to other countries, in particular Europe, uh, European nations, uh, to, to support this call for democracy. Um, you know, Maduro, like, like I said, I, I, I really meant it. When I when I referred to he he he's facilitated a, a humanitarian crisis. Um, the media has 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 really covered uh, quite a bit the, the 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 plight of the Syrian refugees, um, but there are more Venezuelan refugees because of Maduro, um, and and I think uh, what we continue to do is, is to shine a light, uh, working with our partners in the region to call for for fee free and fair elections to call for a transition um, and, uh, and and we've we've demonstrated a degree of flexibility what that can look like um, but it really uh, for, for the benefit of the people of Venezuela we, we want to see this, uh, this this call for democracy it has to it's, it has to happen um, and we're continuing to place uh, the maximum pressure pressure on the illegitimate Maduro regime in his inner circle uh, the administration is absolutely resolute on this. Uh, we're continuing to, to find new targets of opportunity uh, and there's constantly new uh, evaluation of, of further where, where to go on this. I mean, you know, and this is also this with, tied in with, uh, with, with Cuba and, and, uh, and, and the, the state support of Maduro. It's not even a country uh, you know, it's a country for Venezuela, but Venezuelans uh, increasingly aren't in control of it. Uh, so we really need to call on, on, on free and fair elections. Uh, Maduro needs to, to, to move on. 
Um, and that's what we're going to continue to, to call for. You know, we, we, part of our sanctions, I think it's really, uh, it's critical to underscore our sanctions have always been to apply the maximum pressure campaign uh, in a variety of ways that, uh, that, that, uh, that Maduro has just kind of had a, a, it's kind of like a more of an organized crime boss than anything else in terms of uh, sacking the country, uh, having a graph system and using um, oil revenues for uh, illicit, illicit means. He, but it's, you know, the country in 2013, the country was producing nearly 3 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, it, that's dropped in January 2019, prior to the, our imposition of sanctions, it was only producing 1.2. I mean, the, the, the utter abject failure of the illegitimate regime to manage this endowment to the, for the benefit of all Venezuelans uh, is absolutely, absolutely tragic. Um, pursuant to our sanctions, now they're producing, you know, 400,000 or, or less barrels per day. Um, but our target is because of this kleptocracy and this illegitimacy uh, and because of this human rights crisis. And uh, we call, call it a, an immediate cessation of that activity. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, it's, it's really important to understand all these different aspects of, of what you're doing in the Energy Bureau. It's obviously a very diverse set of issues and countries that you're working on, even just within the Western Hemisphere. It's a, it's a huge portfolio. Um, so, you know, I'm really glad that you were able to take the time to participate in this conference um, and spend this half hour with us to share updates on it on um, all the initiatives and really hear your perspective on all these critical issues for the region um, so thank you so much thank you again for joining us and uh, hopefully again in the future you'll be able to join us um, so this concludes hopefully in person yes thank you hopefully. <laughs> thank you um, and this i just want to conclude um, the program um, this is the end of the Latin America Energy Conference. So um, I just want to conclude by thanking again uh, everyone who joined us today, um, the speakers. I also want to thank the sponsors, um, Conoco Phillips and Chevron. I want to thank my colleagues Sarah Phillip and Nate Graham for their contributions. And um, as Assistant Secretary Fannin said, I hope to see you all next time in person at our fifth Latin America Energy Conference. Have a good afternoon.